I'm so glad to be back in Barcelona because I was just here for Spring I.O. Uh, in May. So just very excited to have this opportunity again and come back uh, to this beautiful city, um, seeing some old friends, old fellow speakers in here and meeting new folks. And so I'm just very excited and thank you, gracias. Thank you, everybody. So yeah, so my talk today is on event streaming uh, for the best of all worlds and specifically too, I will be introducing you to Apache Pulsar. Um, how many of you have heard of, I actually did a poll too, how many of you have heard of Pulsar? Yeah, I'm just curious, okay. All right, so not many, yeah. And then obviously then among you, you probably, have you worked, anybody, have you worked with Pulsar? Uh, or, okay, maybe not, that's okay. So that's what this session is for, to introduce you to Pulsar. But let me also ask you, how many of you are already working with, let's say, an event streaming platform like Kafka? Yeah. So yeah, so I'm sure there are a lot more of you too. And I like to say that I'm not here to, you know, kind of like, so to speak, set the stage of competing. I think the more I'm learning about Pulsar, it's really on a different level, this streaming platform, more for a cloud native uh, environment, so it's different. So I like to kind of highlight the strength of Pulsar in here. So. Okay, so again, this is my slide deck. If you'd like to get a, a hold of my slide deck while I'm talking, it's here. And if you miss it, don't worry about it. I will be sharing my slide deck afterwards too, after this talk. So, so let me introduce myself. So my name is Mary Grigleski. I'm a senior developer advocate at DataStax. Um, DataStax, if you're familiar with Cassandra, you may be aware of DataStax, uh, a managed Cassandra platform. That's the, the flagship product, Astra DB. So now about a year or so ago, before I joined too, they started wanting to expand into supporting event streaming and adding that capability to Cassandra and other things too. So anyway, so DataStax is really a no SQL database, uh, data store kind of company doing big data. Um, they are adding streaming uh, to cloud native platform. I was actually previously with IBM, and some of you too have asked me, oh, aren't you with IBM? Yeah, I was with IBM uh, for the past three and a half years before joining DataStax. So I joined DataStax earlier this year. Um, and I'm based in Chicago. Um, I'm also a, an active community builder and organizer, so I'm president of the Chicago Java Users Group. Um, I'm also a Java champion, and also I help out with a couple of other community tech groups in Chicago area. So if you ever come to Chicago, or even if you want to join these days, we are run still running live streams of our meetups too, so please do check us out if you like. Um, so, okay, so my background though, before becoming an advocate, I was a developer myself for over 20 years. So I understand very well how it feels to be a developer in an IT uh, company, especially kind of financial or cell phone company, that's where I worked before. So, and then you have to handle and support like production systems. So, and I've stayed overnight to do some huge testing, that type of stuff. So I understand kind of perfectly how it feels to in kind of large company. So yeah, so that's my area. I've been doing Java since 2000, um, or like earlier in, the, in this millennium. And I was back at Sybase and was working on the app server platform there, development, um, development team. So, okay, that's me. And then this is just another diagram with some uh, icons about myself, right? The, the stickers about me at CJOG, Java Champion, all these things. I'm really a passionate advocate. So, okay, so let me start. Then today's um, talk is on event streaming. So I'm hoping too is also taking this opportunity to clarify a bit about event streaming because even when I first started working with event-driven, event messaging, messaging, all of these, it tends to be confusing to a lot of folks, especially if you're new. Um, they are not exactly the same, but events though um, does have like a common kind of uh, starting point. We are talking about processing events, you know, in, compute, in computing sense, right? So I just want to clarify a couple of terms terms of you can bear with me, if you're already familiar with it, there may be some basic concepts that I, I'll bring up first. So, so I'll be talking about event streaming, event processing, some complex event processing, and then event-driven versus message-driven uh, messaging. And then some uh, the, about its semantics of uh, event processing, like pops up and queuing. And then why event streaming and why is it important now? 
And then I'll give you a brief introduction to Apache Pulsar, but as such too, it is a, a big platform um, in just so many things. So I can only touch on some highlighting, you know, highlighting some features about it. So that's what I'll introduce you to. And also, why Pulsar, right? And why is it maybe it's a choice for you if you are looking beyond just doing distributed messaging like Kafka, for example. So, Okay, so I'll start with the many facets of computing events. So first of all, um, what is an event, right? So like generically speaking, not even with computers. Basically, I look up the dictionary, merriam-webster.com. So it's really about something just happens. It's an occurrence. So that's actually, you know, in computing terms, in computing world, um, this is the thing nowadays that we want to do. If you think about it, we human beings, we live and we're, we don't work in a synchronous fashion. However, when we first started learning about computers, I'm sure most of us are, we learn about programming in a synchronous fashion. We're building things that are more structured data, we're doing request and response, and everything is like in a synchronous fashion. You need to issue a command, and, and then you wait for the, you know, it to be processed, and then they will, you wait for the results to come back to you. So that's kind of very typical of how we started programming. However, we realize that you know, human beings, we don't operate like that. You know, think of how you know, we're just using a walkie-talkie and talk, and you have to press the button when you say you're talking, and then you're done, you have to say over, and then you know, that's more synchronous. So that's not very efficient. And in fact, event processing is already, event-driven type of you know, computing is already started a uh, long time back with telecommunications, for example. And specifically, let's say with Erlang, that they're using actor model back in the 80s or 90s, that time frame, they're already using actor model like the Lightband uh, company is doing uh, for Arca platform, right? So that's already a form of messaging. So anyway, so going back, that's event. And then I also found out this very interesting on the fourth bullet point here is that event really is the fundamental activity of observed physical reality represented by a point designated by three coordinates of place and one of time. And so the fourth dimension, which also you include the time in it, in the space-time con continu continuum, postulated by a theory of relativity. Okay, so you're saying that, well, you know, we're not talking about, you know, theory in here, but I think I find it interesting. It's more like when we work with events, if we want to represent it, we're using a math model of X, Y, Z coordinate plus the time that kind of, kind of associated with it. So events, that's the challenge, is that it keeps changing. The state of data keeps changing, and that's what we're trying to do in computing, is to try to capture that and preserve it and also make sure there's, we keep the integrity of event, events you know, in your computing sense. So that's a challenging area. I think I, I'm kind of really interested in that, and I'm sure here, Olena, who's actually from Ivan, is talking about Kafka. We're dealing with messaging. It's just so exciting. So that's event. And so now, then let's talk about event streaming and processing. So if we go back to that XYZ point, right? So the practice of taking action on these series of data points, you know, that originate from a system that continuously creates data, that's basically is the, is the event, right? That's happening. And then the streaming is the ongoing delivery of those events. And streaming is really more complicated in the sense that you're taking many data points happening at any point in time, asynchronously, all of these things, you, and those are streaming, is a continuous delivery, not just like with the one event happening. There are multiple, many events happening at different times in space and time. So then a series of events can also be referred to as streaming data or data streams. So as such, too, we also are hearing about, like if you watch movies, we're streaming because they are data that's continuously traveling to your devices, right? And all of these things, those are streaming. So here too, we're, the talk is about event streaming. And specifically too, we're now kind of bringing event, event streaming to a higher level. It's beyond just distributed messaging. Messaging, to me, in my mind at least, I kind of look at it, it's more mechanical. We're dealing with messaging, travel from one point to the other, deliver everything to your destination. But complex, it's basically you bring it to another level. You are looking for ways to solve more complex, um, you know, kind of complex problems in life. For example, over here, complex event processing. We want to capture the data, not only capture, but analyze these streams of data as they arrive. And the purpose of such is to identify 
opportunities or threats, right? So for example, you can be doing fraud detection. Nobody wants to do it in the old-fashioned batch processing way. You want to do it in real time. As it happens, somebody is, your account, your bank account is having some suspicious activities. You want to have some ways of detecting that right away and act on it. So fraud detection system is a, one of the best example of you know, the use case for applying this event processing technique to it. And also, I actually will also be doing another talk. It's basically for trading to, for example, I'm not sure how many of you are working with financial company, maybe like doing trade engines and trade matching. Yeah, so anyway, I just brought it up because I, I work for Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So they do trading of futures and options, which is a step above just stock trading. But the concept is the same. Anytime you want to do trade, then you have a buy. Somebody wants to buy it, you know, some stocks, and then the other want to sell. So you want to have to do matching. So that has to be real, real fast. So I think that will be also a good way of, like, in terms of having a use case, a sophisticated and advanced use case of utilizing event streams kind of processing way of doing things. So I'm trying to do that now because you can actually set up data feeding in into your system, one buy, one sell, and you want to look for the match, you know, and it's actually quite interesting too. Anyway, so that's kind of example too of doing complex event processing. You want to be able to add value to what you're doing every day in a very responsive fashion, basically. And um, so, yeah, so you want to have data that's happening, you want to capture and basically um, identify those patterns and do something to it as it happens. So, okay, so now then I'll also get into the next thing, which is about the messaging part. So messaging too, as such, right, is about always a sender and a receiver. Then there's event-driven. So event-driven is about sender admitting messages, and then sender doesn't really care so much about who is getting the messages. So you don't care about the address of who is going to re uh, receive it, for example. So in a pop-up type of scenario, it's publish, publishers sub publish, publish the messages, and then it's a subscriber. If they're interested, they can subscribe to the messages to get it. So that's kind of more like a one-to-many type of uh, messaging. Then that's kind of is being labeled as event-driven. Um, and by the way, too, I get this uh, interpretation from Lightband, and they actually do the reactive manifesto, and they were explaining these quite clearly. So I thought this is, makes a lot of sense. Event-driven is about one-to-many kind of relationship, whereas for message-driven messaging, we're kind of dealing with sender and receiver. They are already, they need to know each other. It's more like one-to-one, -one. kind of um, like, think of it like a connection that's being sustained, you know, in a session, and, and you'll be having the known sender knowing who the receiver is, so you know you have to know the address of the receiver, and then that helps with the messaging part of, of the two, like one-to-one -one relationship. And very often too, we also call it like point-to-point -point, uh, kind of delivery of messages too. So those are kind of differences. And now let me then also take a look then into um, differences between the between the event approach versus batch processing. As I mentioned too. That's the, the plus thing about using an event-driven type of systems, event, all these things. They are a bit harder to do, I'm sure, not just a bit. Sometimes it's just harder to do. But they, the, the benefits is a lot because you can get results in a real-time, immediate kind of uh, fashion. Now, not everything is kind of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, ideal for using this approach. There's also then batch processing, which I'm sure you're also, some of you may be already familiar with, it, in which data is being collected over time, and then the processing is being done at a later time. So for example, things like uh, a system of records, right? If you have a company, you have many employees, and employees making changes to all of these data, you don't want to, like for every changes, you don't want to immediately maybe update your database right away because your database is busy serving some other things that are more urgent during the day. So that type of things, like you can wait, right? So very often, if we are an employee at a company, we usually, oh, I'll update my home address, I just moved. And usually it doesn't take effect until a few days later because all of these processing are being, or the data that's been changed get collected and then set aside and get processed later. So there's also a purpose for do why we want to do things in, batch, in a batch fashion too. So we have to always make sure we use the right tools for the right job, is, is what I'm trying to say. But event-driven definitely has its place in today's world. 
Okay, so now then I'll take a bit look then into event messaging, like the semantics and the patterns, which actually I already talked about. So when we talk about streaming, very often then we are referring to PubSub, the publish, subscribe type of approach. So we are using publishing client. We always refer their client and basically publisher or the producer producing the messages, the data, will send the data and then send it to the broker. So broker is like the middle person, is an agent that kind of receives all the data and responsible for distributing the data to the receiving side. And the receiving side, we call them subscriber. It's like, if I'm interested in it, I'll subscribe to, the, to this data. But actually, too, I can use specific terms, which is topics. In Kafka, too, it's called, also called topic, and JMS, too, there's topics and all of these. So in Pulsar, too, for example, it, we, we also have pops up and we have a broker that actually will, will be the one that's managing all of the data that comes in and out. There, and also, too, I like to use this analogy of the broker. It's like a postmaster. It's like, you know, you, if I'm sending out some data, let's say, or, or letters, right, I go to the post office. So broker is like the postmaster in the post office that will collect all of the, the messages, and then it will be distributed to the, to the uh, client. However, in this case, too, it's not like exactly like a post office because you don't really write the address. It's more like, okay, I will label the messages uh, you know, as a topic, we, I call it a, a topic. And basically, um, yeah, the, the topic, so in, in some ways it's like, how do you route it? It's like a router kind of information. So the broker will go by that. And then if I'm interested in the messages, the subscriber will then subscribe to this topic. And then whenever there are messages that comes into the topic, then the broker will deliver the messages accordingly. Of course, it's not that simple in a sense, because when we do pops up, you can be having messages that are being delayed or being delivered at a certain time, all of these things too. Uh, or sometimes too, there are messages that are called last will messages. Uh, for example, like if you know, the client dies and, and you know, all of these things, and you want to set what is called like a last will. So then it says, okay, my message dies, but I still want to make sure some messages get gets delivered to the recipient side, whoever is subscribing to me. So all of these rules, these are ex example that make this pops up topic to be, this mechanism to be, can, be, can get to be quite complicated in that sense. So anyway, so this is the streaming and the, the things that we're looking at today at IoT devices, all of these, they are using the pops up mechanism behind the scenes. The really good advantage of it is that you can scale really, really well. If you have different brokers that are handling different topics and you have senders send, keep sending messages through, it actually scales very well. It can handle stuff in like the billions and trillions of data, maybe in a second, in a minute, like that. So, so that's that. And now then I'll look into another way of handling messaging will be message queuing. So queuing is more the one to the point, uh, point to point type of uh, kind of communication is a form of asynchronous service-to-service -service communication and is used in serverless and microservices architecture. So messages are stored in the queue until they are processed. But this difference is that the process, is, uh, the message is only, it only gets to be processed only once and by a single customer. So that's the difference. So that's mes message queues. And so, um, and then in Pulsar too, I'll be introducing to you is that Pulsar can actually handle both. It has a pops up as a broker, but you can also use what is called an exclusive subscription mode that you can only I identify one consumer for that particular subscription. So it makes it capable of being a message queue kind of processor as well. So, so those are the differences. Okay. So event streaming now, then I'll kind of get more into it after I talk about some, you know, all of these basic things. It's basically event streaming is a step beyond just event messaging, as I've mentioned about. Now it has its, oops, it has its place too, of course, you know, we're doing messaging that's already so complicated. I mean, as such, right, like Kafka and, you know, at, at Pulsar or any other pops up kind of mechanism, you're handling all of these data. It's essentially to these platforms, they are called distributed logging kind of systems. You need to also store all of the messages as they come in and manage them accordingly. So that's why these are like kind of, you know, complex like streaming type of platform, not just dealing with the messaging part, but really the streaming side. Okay, so now then, why is event streaming kind of important and what is driving this change, right? So basically, I already talked about actually, it's basically you, you want to enable uh, real-time data, right? Uh, 
data, real-time processing. And if you think about it, then who will benefit will be the customers in your case, because you get a better customer experience. You, you have something that you, know, you want to send a request, you get back, back the response much faster, right? So that's a real-time kind of advantage to it too. And it will help if you have a business and if you have things being processed faster. Obviously, everybody would like it too. You know, nobody likes things to be slow. And so, so that's, that's a primary advantage of using event streaming. And then also nowadays, um, I'm sure some of you may be using uh, or working with machine learning, with um, artificial intelligence, all of these two. Basically, also, they will be prime candidate, in my opinion, too, for using an event-driven event approach because you want to build data pipelines, and we're dealing with data that's constantly changing. Um, and if you're working with machine learning uh, stuff, too, and you want to ingest the data in high volumes, but you also want the system to have low latency in terms of response time. So using an event-driven approach would be highly recommended. I think there is still a lot of experiment, um, not really that many production systems using this data pipelining technology yet, or this concept. I've spoken to some machine learning experts. They find it, their data is so big, you know, it, it sometimes it's hard to actually use a real event streaming platform. Although I think event streaming platform is catching up to, to be able to handle data in really huge volumes. For example, at DataStacks, we have Cassandra, for example, and that can actually handle data in huge volumes too. So anyway, so event streaming will be also prime candidate to help with ML ops type of operations, with building data pipelines like that. And then the third advantage of using streaming is basically the scalability part too. So it, you, know, you, want to, you want to be collecting data, let's say in an IoT, in, a, in an agricultural field, and, or let's say, you know, I'd like to use the ex example of IoT, you want to install different temperature sensor in a big field, or you know, kind of miles or kilometers, <laughs> and, and you want to install all these collector of data in a field, so they keep sending data as you know, temperature changes and all these things. So you, so you can imagine if you have so many devices trying to send data, any kind, anytime there's change of the data, the state of data, you want to send the data to your server, right, up there somewhere. And so, so the scalability aspect is what event streaming is really capable of doing too. So those are kind of like the major reason of driving to have event streaming. Okay, so this actually I already talked about it. Essentially, again, highlighting is that you want to make decisions on data in real time, not after the event. You want to be able to ingest high frequency of messages with very low latency in response. So that's the goal. And now, then I will introduce to you Apache Pulsar. So what is it, right? So Pulsar um, was created by Yahoo, by the engineering team. They first started with um, more with the traditional messaging systems, right? They, actually, at that time, I think there was already Kafka at that point in time, and 2010 or 12. And then they found out that because Yahoo was already quite advanced in, in using the cloud at that point in time, like 10 years ago, and they found out that none of the systems were able to handle in a cloud-native type of environment. What if right, you add another you know, cluster to your whole ecosystem? Then what happened, right? And one big challenge is, is that if you actually, for example, I think in Kafka too, right, you have to like, uh, calculate out how many topics you will need how many brokers, how many partitions, all of these things. But Pulsar realized, wow, doing it in Kafka way is just not quite able to, to help in that, so that you can still add and rebalance all of your topics and partitions, but it's not as easy to do. And then it takes time away if we're application developers, we are concentrating on solving business algorithms. Then in that case, we have to worry about doing more DevOps type of thing. How do we kind of scale it? How do we um, rebalance all of our topics, all of these things? So Yahoo, the engineering team, came up with the idea of Pulsar. So it's essentially, I call it um, Pulsar, uh, was born with the cloud native DNA, you know, so because I got asked, I think at Spring IO, they said it's uh, Pulsar on steroids, like, uh, like uh, over, it's like Kafka on steroids. I said, well, not quite, but it's probably Pulsar was born with this DNA, with this already in, because they thought about it, you know, the fact that we're now living in a cloud native age, we need to worry about clusters, you know, kind of up and down, you need to have automatic rebalancing, all these things. So, 
It's essentially it's a cloud native design of Pulsar, and it supports like it's cluster based already, and it supports like multi tenancy too. So I'll show a bit. There's a diagram I'll show you about what multi tenancy is, and then you can you can interact it with very simple APIs. Um, Java primarily is Java. You can also uh, use C sharp too. It supports .NET. Python and Go, and there are also community contributors doing like things like Scala and Ruby as well, other uh, languages as well. So one uh, one advantage too of using Pulsar is that it separates out the compute and the storage. As I mentioned, with you know, with uh, distributed logging um, systems, right, like Kafka, um, Pulsar, we're dealing with a lot of messages that comes through all the time. So Pulsar, actually, they design it, they decide, well, you know, it's dealing with storage isn't our business, so let's delegate it. So they essentially, too, have Apache Zookeeper to help them with managing all of these logging. So it's in a way, too, if you think about it, right, I have a large house. Do I want to spend the time cleaning my house? No, you want to hire somebody else, right, to come and do the cleaning for you. It's kind of same in a crude way. I'm describing this. It's like, okay, Pulsar just says I'm cons I'm only I only want to deal with managing all of the messages, dealing with the brokers. So all of the storage, I'll have Zookeeper do it for me. And believe it or not, right, all of these logging messages they get very very complicated. You need somebody to help you. How do you deal with you know when you deal with data, writing data to database, you want to guarantee, right, you don't lose any messages, all these kind of things, right? It's like any kind of accounting thing, you want to keep the integrity. So Pulsar has um, Zookeeper do it for, for, for it. So, so you separate out, then it makes the scaling part a lot easier, too, because anytime you need to scale, you let the other, you know, Apache Zookeeper here to kind of deal with, you know, going, growing and shrinking all of these things. So, so that's another kind of key thing about Pulsar. Now, Pulsar too, because it is a pub sub kind of delivery, message delivery system, so it guarantees um, message delivery too. That's very important in any kind of asynchronous messaging systems. So it has these QoS, if you're familiar with quality of service. It also has like deliver once messages or deliver one or more times or deliver or fire and forget type of thing. So it, it Pulsar broker handles all of the message delivery. Uh, it guarantees it too. Um, and then also, too, messages, too, sometimes right, if you do messaging systems, you, you don't want to maybe pass through the messages. You want to do some sort of transformation, um, creating kind of complex kind of processing logic within that cluster, right? There you, you're building small pipelines of getting the source of data, traveling through Pulsar, and then depositing it or sending it over to a sync, a you know, receiving side. Then you want to be able to transform the data as it, as it happens. And Pulsar has a, a feature called Pulsar Functions, too. It's much like AWS, like Lambdas, or doing Azure uh, serverless, something like that. So you can actually transform your messages. And I can quickly later show you a, um, a, an example of how you can write a, a Pulsar function is actually uh, not that complicated. So, okay, so it helps with that. And then also with Pulsar, it has a tiered storage offloads too. So basically, it has built in capability of recognizing if your data is getting cold, you know, you, you already finished processing, the data hasn't been touched for a while, then it also, you can set up mechanism of it being moved to cold and long-term storage too. So from the hot storage to the cold long-term storage when the data is aging out. So a lot of these kind of things, more administrative side, Pulsar can do it kind of uh, natively. It's, it is kind of built in it's, it's in its nature. That's why I call it, it has the DNA of a cloud native kind of system. So. Okay, so again, this I just wanted to show a bit of an example too of what is Apache Pulsar. It's a unified distributed messaging and streaming platform. So open source was originally developed at Yahoo and they contributed to uh, the Apache Software Foundation in 2016 and has become a top level project in 2018. So it quickly became kind of um, catching the attention because of people recognizing it, having that cloud native capability to do like streaming, you know, in the cloud uh, cloud age, essentially. Um, and so it supports uh, Kubernetes, and it also supports multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, and even on-prem, you can basically bolt on and add in Pulsar to, to, do, to do things for you too. So as you can see, there's a couple graphs over here. It's basically showing you there's an increase you know, number of stars on GitHub and also number of contributors to the project as well. So 
Yeah, so it is gaining in popularity. And who else is using Pulsar? So as you can see over here, just a small sample, uh, Yahoo, they are still uh, using it, and also other companies, as you can see in here, they are bigger, you know, all kinds, right? There are telecommunications, or Splunk, it's another company dealing with uh, logging and things like that, so. Okay, so Pulsar is different, just wanted to highlight, right? Again, I just want to kind of separate out in, about Pulsar, what exactly, you know, all of the, you know, high-level components are. They're a producer, right? They are a client application that, has, that can send messages to topic that's managed by the broker. And consumer is the other side. They are a client application that wants to read messages from a topic that's, that's managed by the broker. And then, as such, the broker is a stateless process uh, that handles incoming messages and all of these message dispatching, uh, communicates with the Pulsar configuration store, and store messages in bookkeeper instances. So broker is the one that's responsible for communicating, coordinating things with the bookkeeper, too. So again, bookkeeper is the one that manages the persistence of all of the message store, all of these distributed logs. Um, and then there's also Zookeeper, too, that Pulsar uses to help with managing all the clusters and as such, right, Zookeeper is to coordinate all of these different clusters and all the tasks that needs to happen. So those are kind of like five main um, kind of uh, components that, com that kind of uh, make up uh, Pulsar. So as you can see over here, yeah, producer, consumer, communicate. You can have multiple brokers and there are also topics that can be spread out in, uh, in different like uh, brokers as well, and the different partitions that we call. And then as you can see, all of the messages that comes in, it's basically delegated to Bookie, which is the bookkeeper. And Bookie itself will manage all of your, your messages because there are tons of messages coming in. It will segment off all of these messages in a very organized fashion because that's what Bookie does, is managing all of these kind of, so to speak, kind of mundane but repetitive type of messages, but in a very efficient way. So, and as you can see at the side here is Zookeeper is keeping everybody in sync, you know, not fighting and all of these things. So, okay. And then also another note in here is a uh, uh, Pulsar follows a tiered architecture design approach. Um, is take, makes use of a traditional multi-node architecture. Um, and basically it helps with horizontal scaling. And also the partition topic uh, will, will mask the comp complexity from the consumers too. So again, very right, common challenges in this type of cloud native environment for doing, um, doing distributed messaging is basically the scaling part, right? If you want to scale, you need to then, all of these partitions, you need to rebalance it. So it helps, and Pulsar does it, it's very flexible, it does it for you. So then you don't need to, you don't need to recalculate, well, how should I move, you know, where, where should the topics be? Pulsar will do it for you, so it's a really big plus. So then you as developers can focus on your business applications and let Pulsar handle all of these kind of a repetitive type of uh, task, right, for you. Um, so, okay, so that's it. And then the second thing I'm basically talking about is it, it's there are tightly, okay, so basically the persistence and the message serving capabilities are not tightly coupled. So then it helps too, because if you spread out the, the responsibility, then Pulsar can focus on doing the compute side. So, so that's a really big plus. The design is well designed for cloud native environments. Okay. So here too, actually this might be another, it's just for my company, I thought I should show it too. Um, anyway, so I already talked about, okay, what is the big deal? It's fast, right, in low impact and horizontal scaling, right, and all these things. And broker too itself is stateless, and it's, it already has a built-in low balancing capability, so you don't need to worry about it, right? It scales really well. And if there's disaster recovery, right, you kind of, another node takes over, basically it does all of the rebalancing itself and all of these. And then, of course, Bookie too, just a little, little kind of highlight in there if you are ever interested in working on an open source project like Bookkeeper, basically it supports this wall base is right ahead uh, logging uh, kind of specification, which, which kind of guarantees guarantees that data coming in will actually be, be preserved, you know, the data will be accurate and before writing it to permanent storage, that the, that's the wall uh, specific kind of specification too. So it's very low latency and it's fault tolerant uh, storage type of services. So that's Bookie's um, kind of uh, strength of Bookie. So we kind of rely on Bookkeeper, Bookie, to handle all of these logging messages. Um, fast writes guarantee through their journals and segment concentric like data persistence via their ledgers um, kind of mechanism too. So all of these things. 
Okay, so this one too is just again another kind of a summary of it. You can also see too, like Pulsar, you can bolt on, you can add in. You don't need to change what you're already doing. You have Kafka in the house, you have JMS, you have RabbitMQ. If you don't want to change them, you can keep them and then basically put on top Pulsar in there. And then Pulsar can be kind of the unifying layer that manages all of your different disparate systems too. So it has pops up, it has queuing, it does streaming for you, and also the message mediation and enrichment through the use of the Pulsar functions too. So out of the box capabilities already, you can do cloud, on premise or hybrid. And it also has this feature called geo replication too. If you are like large data centers that are located in different continents, there's also this capability of doing like multiple data centers and it can do all the replication for you. And you can have specific um, like configuration that's for only certain regions. Say for example in Europe, and you can, you know, we have to worry about data compliancy, there's GDPR here, but whereas in the US there isn't such thing yet. And so there are also different state has different kind of rules and you can actually set it up in, on the configuration that will help you with all of the replication and it knows itself, you know, how do I replicate? So it's pretty sophisticated in that sense. And it supports like multi-region through the multi-tenancy kind of uh, design approach and data lake uh, integration too and much, much more. It is still evolving as we speak. Okay, so how is it different? Actually, I want to show this. So again, just want to summarize, right? Key differentiator one is separate out the compute and storage part. So that's a big thing. Basically, too, with this distributed tiered architecture, um, and it helps, right? And so, you, again, you know, Pulsar, it's like up there doing, doing all of these things. Okay, the producer, consumer dealing with the broker, the broker has his own partition, but then all of the logging gets delegated to uh, here below, the segmented off by a bookkeeper. So bookkeeper will worry about dealing with all of the data. So then Pulsar can worry only about your business side of things, and broker will communicate with the bookkeeper. Um, it's, so again, um, what are the things? Okay, so that's good. So it helps with kind of a horizontal scaling um, capability is also very well to not just vertical scaling, but the horizontal scaling as well. And then again, oh, I already talked about this is the geo replication. Um, so basically it helps with hands off like real time message replication across different data centers. Um, and it's very flexible, the messaging, replication mode and patterns, also very um, kind of efficient too. You can do synchronous versus asynchronous kind of patterns and there's active, 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 passive. So if you're working with more of this uh, you know, rec data recovery kind of mechanism, all of these things is already built in for you in Pulsar. Um, so, uh, and it, it helps too with the geo replication again, that helps you. One big thing, good thing is helps you with the data compliance requirements across different regions. So, um, so it's just a matter of more like configuration if you have different data centers. So instead of you having had to calculate or do all of these things, you can actually rely on Pulsar having already that building capability to do that for you. And then, okay, so this one is the supporting multi-regions. So there's this multi-tenancy concept too in Pulsar that it supports. Um, so basically, um, it helps with the operations, it simplifies it too. As you can see, right, you can have a cluster, and within your cluster, you basically divide up, right, all of your different concerns of your business. You can, let's say, you have a tenant in your company, you are only managing the finance department in one. And then there's also uh, one in marketing, and then within it, it manages all of its data. And then another one is the product team, right? You can have different things. So it helps too when you think of messages being divided up, being like in a multi-tenant fashion. It actually organizes things for you much better too. And so um, it's very, especially it helps too is with security, compliance, and auditing type of thing. You, if you have this kind of like demarcation, it makes the managing side much more easier too in that sense. So, okay. So, okay, so the other thing I won't go over, but again, multi-tenancy is another big thing about Pulsar. And then this one too, is about a very flexible message processing model that Pulsar has. So there are different subscription modes. Again, right, we talk about uh, this pops up kind of mechanism. So you have a uh, producer producing messages and send it to the topic. But the thing is with the subscription side, there are different types of subscription mode that you can have. So the top one here, 
the exclusive mode, it's basically you only define having one consumer. So that makes it like a message queuing. That enables message queuing in pulsars because if you want to use exclusive mode. And there's also, if you, want, you, you worry about you know, your, your consumer maybe in debt or something, then you can actually use a failover mode. And in that case, you have two consumers. One acts as a primary consumer. The other is the secondary or backup. If, in case cons the, the primary consumer goes away, you have the backup one. And then there's also a shared subscription over here. So shared subscription. You can essentially have multiple consumers too. So perfect for like cloud native environment. That's kind of a shared subscription. Like your messages sent to that uh, topic and the subscription is all being shared by multiple consumers. And if you, want, if you want to guarantee the ordering of all of your messages, you can actually use another mode which is called key shared. So it's similar to shared, except key share will guarantee the ordering of the messages too. So, so these are like the four kind of modes of subscription that Pulsar has. Okay, oops, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, this one, okay. So this one is just kind of summarizing why Pulsar. I think I already kind of talked enough, is essentially it's very flexible. It acts as a distributed log, uh, like Kafka or pure messaging systems like RabbitMQ. Maybe some of you are using RabbitMQ or any kind of uh, MQ system. And it's just a step beyond, again, right? It has multiple types of subscriptions, guaranteed delivery and retention policies, and it deals with like also schema evolution, too. I'll introduce you quickly, too, about something about some of these Pulsar features. So um, anyway, so I already stepped through it, so I won't kind of go through, but essentially it's the flexibility you can get by using, you know, like a cloud-native ready event streaming platform such as Pulsar. Okay, just highlighting a few Pulsar developer features. Okay, so there's we we any time we talk about kind of re, kind of event driven thing is about uh, data pipeline. So basically, the function there's this Pulsar functions is there to transform the data in the most efficient way. I'm not actually an artist, but I was thinking of okay, I want to show right data comes in from a source. It's like a faucet. You turn on water coming in, and it goes through different pipes, travels to it, and then basically this whole section in here I call it the Pulsar. The Pulsar thing over here is the Pulsar functions. You can apply different like functions right, to transform your data, for example, and kind of any kind of message mediation. And then at the end, too, you output it to a sync, and that's what it's called. Like, it's much like very typical, a source and a sync. A sync is where you collect all the output. And from there, you can actually build another data pipeline, too. So that's the kind of a, like a, a advantage of uh, doing processing uh, the data pipeline way. You can actually think of it like Lego pieces. You can pluck them all together and unplug them and mix and match different pieces to it. So that's the, the thing about data pipeline. Okay, and then this is just another uh, explanation. Pulsar functions and allows for complex streaming processing, very lightweight, and it's essentially function as a service. So it's get inspired by AWS, Lambdas, by Google Functions, all of these things. And you can use Java, Python, and Go at this point. And as you can see, you can have different topics that have messages coming in through the Pulsar function. You can transform it. And then there's also log outputs, too. You can also write the logs to another output topic, for example, and then like that. So that's Pulsar function. But let me also then quickly show you uh, over here too, like how do you do a function, right? Pulsar function, oops. Actually, is it this one? No. I get, I get too many things, I'm so sorry. Okay, uh, so sorry. I was trying to, okay, sorry about that. Uh, I actually had the function up and then now I lose, lost it. But Okay, well, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of go back to it because I think we're short on time, but I also have some other uh, quick thing to show you too. Okay. Maybe I'll move on first. And let me talk about then, there's also a feature called Pulsar Schema too. So as such, right, when we're dealing with distributed systems or sys messaging systems, we, are, we have to deal with data as they travel on the wire, right? So now if you don't kind of deal with all of the transfer of all, all the data, the detail, you, you basically have to worry about doing serializing your data or deserializing. So essentially, before you send the data over, you have to flatten all your data as like bytes, right, and travel on the wire, right? So the thing is, if you don't use something like Pulsar Schema, 
then you have to write your own serialization and deserialization um, kind of code to handle all flattening your data before transferring, and then after it goes over the wire, you have to un unflatten or rebuild it, deserialize it, right? So, or kind of marshalling and unmarshalling in the RPC sense, right? So the thing is with Pulsar is that you can actually leverage on their Pulsar schema features. There's a schema, essentially, is a built-in schema registry, and it can handle primitive data types, like you know, Boolean, your, your things you're familiar with, integer strings, all of these things, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and then you can also uh, have schema type that is a key value pair of data, too. And as well as JSON or F-Row format and protobuf as well. So all of these two Pulsar schema can handle for you if you don't want to write your own serialization and deserialization of data. So that's kind of nice, too, because if your data evolves over time, we think having a schema will help you too. Then you don't need to worry about, okay, now I got to rewrite my or update my serialization code, right? For example, like that. So, and this schema, it helps too with the versioning and compatibility. So it's kind of a nice kind of feature that manages all of the actual data uh, kind of that you need to handle in your system. So that's Pulsar schema. And it has automatic management or manual management as well. And then another thing too I want to kind of uh, show to you is that I talk about data pipelines. So there's also this feature called Pulsar I.O. Essentially, you can build your own connectors. So think of the possibility, right? Actually, right now too, we have data stacks actually comes up also with Kafka connector as well now. So uh, officially, because Astra Streaming just got released like two weeks ago. Astra Streaming is, Astra DB is our managed Cassandra platform, but there's also Astra Streaming. So, we also come up with Kafka uh, Sync and then uh, the Rabbit MQ Sync too. Now the thing is, if you have other data, data like destination you want to use, and there isn't already a connector, you can use Pulsar I/O. It's just a set of kind of a small toolkit. You can actually write your own connector. For example, somebody came to me and said, "Oh, there's Terracotta. It's kind of like older." Um, kind of data, uh, kind of ERP type of system. So the thing is, you can also look into writing your own code to write your sync too. So that's kind of the flexibility of it. Okay, so this, let me kind of really quickly go through data stacks, right? Data stacks too, we have, again, I mentioned about Astra DB is the managed uh, Cassandra platform. And uh, then there's also, we have added in Astra Streaming, which actually is Pulsar underneath the hood too. Uh, that helps you with, uh, with all of the uh, streaming part. And then there's also Luna Streaming. Luna Streaming is essentially relying on open source. Um, you can actually use it for free. You can host your own. Uh, but thing is, if you can also buy the enterprise support too. And then if you don't want to pay, you want to manage everything and do your own support, you can always use the open source version. So data stacks too, we essentially have Luna streaming and you can host your own and uh, it's available now. And Astra streaming just got released two, three weeks ago or so. It's all hosted, it's a database or a software, SaaS software as a service. It's open source by foundation and we also have fully supported offering too. It's serverless com consumption price and all of these things. So we still are accepting early ac access participants if you're interested too. Okay, so this one, I think I won't compare about this, but want to show you a, a picture too of the architecture advantage of Pulsar is segment-oriented log ma management. I think I already kind of talked about it like over here. If we compare with Kafka, Kafka doesn't have that separation. So, and whereas Pulsar, Bookkeeper, uh, does have the separation. So. I don't know why, I think maybe I got my slides out of sync, but okay, sorry. But Okay, so real, real quick demo. Uh, it's not really a quick, quick demo. It's basically, I want to invite you to, there's, um, again, I talk about Astra. Astra DB is the multi-cloud database um, uh, managed, uh, or multi-cloud, uh, multi, well, uh, it's Cassandra on the cloud, right? So offered by Datastax. So you can, anybody can sign up to, and I have the link for it. And if you sign up, you don't need your, uh, whoops, uh, you don't need your credit card, and you get $25 per month, US dollar, uh, for use to. So as you can see, if you want to play with manage Cassandra too, you can do it in here, you can create database, all of these things. Uh, as you can see, I already have different things set up in here. But let me quickly show you. You can also create different organization too in this, uh, in this console, which is very easy. And I ha happen to have a customer or vendor uh, collaboration. So I already have a streaming. Uh, that I set up in here. So you can actually, if you need to create a Pulsar stream, it's as easy as create a stream, 
and then you enter your tenant. Remember the multi-tenancy. You can create your tenant and then pick your cloud. Right now, it's only Google Cloud, Amazon, and Microsoft Azure. But you can select a region, and basically, let's say, you know, I'll say uh, JBCN, and I can just do like Europe uh, for this. And then you can see too, over here, the cost isn't that high. And so $25 can, US dollar can actually get you through for, for a whole month if you want to do some small project on your own. So, okay, I won't do it now, but I'll just quickly show you. So I already create a streaming topic. As you can see, we can see all the data in here. I have a topic called POC tenant in here. And if you want to know how to do, create all of your Pulsar streaming, the topic, uh, namespaces, functions, you can actually follow this dashboard and, and it will guide you through too. So over here, you can, um, a quick start is over here, you can do a connect. And the connect will already show you, I've created my tenant, uh, what is the name, you know, the plan type, all of these things, and how do you connect the broker service URL, for example, it's, it's over there, uh, like that. And then topics too. Oh, actually, let me qu really quickly show you. Connect to it will show you if you want to. You're fam we're familiar with Java, so it will give you have some code example that shows you the Maven, the Gradle um, definition, and how do you write a producer, for example, over here. So it's any kind of pops up systems. It's as, sim as simple as you have you do your client connect. Once you get connected, then you can basically uh, create your producer and the topic. And then once you're ready with the, produ the producer is ready, you can actually send the data too. So, okay, it looks like I'm kind of out of time, but also just real quickly, if you want to write the consumer, there's also consumer subscription, uh, subs uh, subscriber code is also in here that shows you. But remember too, if you do any kind of pops up, you always have to have the, cust the consumer ready to, the subscriber be ready. So then, then you write your published code because then w once you publish your data, then your subscriber can see it. So just don't be surprised. Sometimes I've seen people that says, pops up and how come I write my subscriber, I'm not seeing my code or I'm not seeing anything in my code because you're waiting for the messages to come in. So make sure you have both ready and to run to see messages happening. So, okay. And so this is how you do it. And if you want to do the, the uh, Pulsar functions, it's also here. It will guide you to, uh, through it too. So, and how do you do syncs? It's also like, how do you create a sync? It's also here. So again, this is a, a guided way of doing things through the UI, but you can also do things the programmatic way or in the, in the command line fashion. We also have command line called Pulsar client that you can interact with too. So yeah, so I, again, just want to quickly show you this before I go back to my... Uh, slide here, I'll be real quick. So just want to give you some links so then you can follow, um, you know, if you want to continue with this journey of learning more about Pulsar. So these are the different links to Pulsar, to Bookkeeper, to Zookeeper, and also Astra, DB is astra.datastacks.com, all of these uh, links here. And then also, this one just wanted to uh, share with you is a link. If you want to have additional $200 in credit, you do need to give your credit card in here, but you can use the code open source 200 to get that extra $200 credit too for the Astra DB and play around with the Pulsar. Um, and then also I have a, a stream, so I apologize, don't have time today to dem demo too much, but I do have a weekly uh, Twitch stream um, on, yeah, on Wednesday, usually it's on Wednesday, like 2 p.m. Uh, Central Time U.S., so it's about 9 o'clock here, um, that I will have a stream, I demonstrate different things, and, and there is actual live coding too, so. And then also we have our meetup group, Apache Pulsar Neighborhood, and also a uh, wiki page too that anybody can contribute uh, contents to as well. And with that, I want to thank you very much. I'm a little bit over time. So if you have more questions, I welcome any kind of questions. And I want to invite you to, to join me, uh, join my Discord server, because I'm always there and I can answer questions. Or if you want to share with me your project idea, I would love to hear about that too. So please do stay connected and uh, follow me on Twitter as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So, yeah. <laughs>